Destiny, Chapter 5, Gifts and Faith From the top of his rolling freight car, Enrique sees a figure of Christ. In the fields of Veracruz, among farmers and their donkeys piled with sugar cane, rises a mountain. It towers over the train he is riding. At the summit stands a statue of Jesus. It is sixty feet tall, dressed in white, with a pink tunic. The statue stretches out both arms. They reach toward Enrique and the others on top of the rolling freight cars. Some stare silently. Others whisper a prayer. It is early April, 2000. Enrique and his fellow migrants have made it nearly a third of the way up the length of Mexico. Many migrants thank God for their progress. They pray on top of the train cars, asking God to protect them against bandits, who rob and beat them, police, who shake them down, and La Migra, the Mexican immigration authorities who deport them. They ask him to keep them alive until they reach El Norte. In exchange for God's help, they make promises to never drink another drop of alcohol, to be generous and serve him forever. They carry small Bibles wrapped in plastic bags to keep dry when they ford rivers or when it rains. Some pages are especially worn. The one that offers the 23rd Psalm, Psalm, for instance, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Some migrants rely on a special prayer, the Oración a las Tres Divinas Personas, a prayer to the Holy Trinity. It asks God to help them and to disarm any weapon raised against them. It has seven sentences, short enough to recite in a moment of danger. If they rush the words, God will not mind. That night, Enrique climbs to the top of a boxcar. In the starlight, he sees a man on his knees, bending over his Bible, praying. Enrique climbs back down. He does not turn to God for help. With all the sins he has committed, Enrique thinks he has no right to ask God for something. Small Bundles What he receives are gifts. Night has fallen. As the train passes through a tiny town, it blows its soulful horn. Enrique looks over the side. More than a dozen people, mostly women and children, are rushing out of their houses along the tracks, clutching small bundles. Some of the migrants grow afraid. What are these people holding? Will they throw rocks? The migrants lie low on top of the train. Enrique sees a woman and a boy run up alongside his car. Orale, chavo! Here, boy! They shout. They toss up a roll of crackers. Enrique reaches out to grab with one hand, but holds tightly to the car with the other. The roll of crackers flies several feet away, bounces off the car, and thumps to the ground. Now women and children on both sides of the tracks are throwing bundles to the migrants on top of the cars. They run quickly and aim carefully, trying hard not to miss. Enrique looks down. There below him are the same woman and boy from before. They are heaving a blue plastic bag. This time the bundle lands squarely in his arms. It is the first gift. Gracias! Adios! he calls into the darkness. He isn't sure the strangers who pass by in a flash even heard him. He opens the bag. Inside are half a dozen rolls of bread. Enrique is stunned by the generosity. Riding trains through the state of Chiapas has taught him to expect the worst from people. But farther north, in the states of Huasaca and Veracruz, he discovers that people are friendly. In many places throughout Veracruz, people give. Sometimes twenty or thirty people stream out of their homes along the rails and toward the train. They wave, they smile, they shout, and then they throw food. They signal if hostile police are ahead. Perhaps not everyone is that way, but there is a widespread spirit of generosity. Many say it is rooted in residents' indigenous Zapotec and Mixtec cultures. Besides, some say, giving to migrants is a good way to protest Mexico's policies against illegal immigration. As one man who lives near the tracks in Veracruz puts it, it's wrong for our government to send people back to Central America. If we don't want to be stopped from going into the United States, how can we stop Central Americans in our country? The towns of El El Encinar, Fortín de las Flores, Quichapa, and Presidio in particular are known for their kindness. People living along the tracks are annoyed when migrants take clothing from their laundry lines, a police chief says, but only if they don't ask first. Nightly, neighbors come out to chat after long hours of work as bricklayers and field hands. As the evening cools, they hear a diesel horn. The train approaches. Migrants watch from atop the cars as a baker, his hands coated with flour, throws his extra loaves. A seamstress throws sandwiches. A carpenter throws bean burritos. A teenager throws oranges in November when they are plentiful and watermelons and pineapples in July. People who have watched migrants fall off the train from exhaustion bring jugs filled with coffee. 
a stooped woman, more than a hundred years old, who in her youth was reduced to eating the bark of her plantain tree during the Mexican Revolution, forces her knotted hands to fill bags with tortillas, beans, and salsa so her daughter, who is seventy years old, can run down a rocky slope and heave them onto the train. If I have one tortilla, I give half away, the stooped woman says. I know God will bring me more. Gladys Gonzalez Hernandez waits for this diesel horn. There it is at last. The girl runs down the narrow aisles of her father's grocery, snatching crackers, water bottles, and pastries off the shelves. She dashes outside. Gladys and her father, Ciro Gonzalez Ramos, wave the migrants on board the train. She is six years old. Ciro Gonzalez, 35, taught Gladys to do this. He wants her to grow up right. Why do you give them food? She asked him once, her father said, because they have traveled far and haven't eaten. Down the tracks, another man grabs sweaters from his home, hand-me-downs from relatives. He ties them into a knot so they will be easier for train riders to catch. His sister ladles lemonade into a plastic bottle, spilling some in her haste. They are running toward the train as the horn on the locomotive grows louder, more frequent. It is dusk. Headlights glow in the, on the train. The ground rumbles. Wheels pound. The brother and sister edge closer to the tracks, dig in their heels, and brace each other. The man spots migrants and waves a sweater above his head. A teenager in a green and white shirt edges down the ladder on the hopper. He holds on with his right hand and reaches out with his left. Now each second counts. The man and woman thrust up their food, drinks, and clothing. The youngster grabs everything. Gracias, the migrant boy yells above the din. Que Dios los lleve. May God watch over you, the man and woman shout back, eyes smiling. These are unlikely places for people to be giving food to strangers. Here, in these rural areas, 30% of children five years old and younger eat so little that their growth is stunted. The people who live in humble houses near the rails are often the poorest. No one recalls when the giving started, when the gift giving started, probably in the 1980s when Central Americans fleeing war and poverty began riding the rails north in large numbers. Eventually, people along the tracks, particularly in the state of Veracruz, began to bring food, water, or even just prayers out to the trains, often where they slowed for curves or bad tracks. As the numbers of migrants has grown, so has the determination to help. Many people in the area who give are from small towns where roughly one in five youngsters has left for the United States. In these places, residents understand that poor people leave their country because they feel they have to, not because they want to. They have watched and worried as their own children struggled to reach the United States. They know it is even harder, and farther, for the Central Americans to make it. I don't like to feel that I have eaten, and they haven't, one of the food throwers says. Another adds, I figure when I die, I can't take anything with me, so why not give? Still others say, when you see these people, it moves you, it moves you. Can you imagine how far they've come? What if someday something bad happens to us? Maybe someone will extend a hand to us. For some, the migrant's gratitude is reason enough to give. A migrant boarding the train is stunned when, without a word, a man emerging from his house puts a large sandwich stuffed with scrambled eggs into his hands. The migrant, his voice cracking with emotion, says, We could never keep going forward without people like this. These people give you things. In Chiapas, they take things away. Some migrants who haven't eaten in days sob when they are handed a bundle of food. Other times, things come in a small gesture, a smile, a firm handshake before they move on. Some townspeople have decided that giving migrants food and prayers is not enough. They invite strangers to stay, giving them shelter, sometimes for months at a time. There is a great risk in housing migrants. One could be accused of immigrant smuggling. In one town, for more than two decades, priests leading the local church fought for the rights of workers and the poor. The church members were distressed to see groups of migrants huddling to sleep along the nearby tracks of the, in the freezing rain. They saw many migrants injured, some from trying to escape capture, others, from the, others by the train. They invited migrants inside for shelter. Police officers started to run into the church to arrest migrants hiding inside. Sometimes the officers' guns were drawn. One day, church members watched several Migra officers come in and arrest four migrants. The officers hauled migrants by the hair and twisted their wrists behind their backs before throwing them into the back of their pickup trucks. Help us! They're going to hit us! One migrant cried out from the police pickup truck. Shut up! One of the officers said, hitting the migrant with a nightstick several times. 
Afterward, the incensed priest, a crowd of a hundred around him, demanded that the police let the migrants go. This is a church. You have violated this place. Release them, the priest said. He organized teams that would rush out on a moment's notice to aid a migrant being abused by the police. Sometimes whole communities stand up to the police. Residents of El Campesino El Mirador, a real side hamlet nestled in the foot of a mountain, tell this story. El Campesino El Mirador was policed by officers from nearby Nogales. One afternoon in late May 2000, a northbound freight train pulled into a slot pulled onto a siding to let a southbound train pass. At that moment, police officers emerged from a bar by the tracks. Townspeople say the officers looked drunk. The police saw about 50 migrants on top of the stopped train and headed toward the freight cars to arrest them. Migrants jumped off and ran toward the mountain. The police gave chase. Townspeople say the officers began to shoot. One bullet hit a Honduran girl, 17 or 18 years old, in the arm. She was eight months pregnant and said it was because she had been raped by a policeman in Chiapas. The girl clawed her way up the mountain. After about 100 yards, she reached a small concrete platform. On the platform stood a white cross. Panting and bleeding, she stopped, unable to go further. Three police officers caught up to her, grabbed her hair, kicked her, and beat her with their nightsticks. "'Leave me alone,' she cried. "'You've already shot me. I'll lose this child.' Maria Inqueta Reyes Marquez, 38, climbed up to the cross. She says she could see that a bullet had splintered a bone in the girl's arm. It's as if they were hitting a dog, she recalls, her eyes brimming with tears. They treat dogs better than that. They didn't. They don't punish criminals, but they beat up these poor folks. Why? Why? Reyes said she demanded, stop hitting her. She and about 50 other people encircled the girl and cross. They turned to the officers. Cowards! Why are you hitting her? Two of the officers ran down the hillside, away from the angry mom, mob. Someone kicked the third in the buttocks until he ran as well. To protect migrants from corrupt police, individuals have also invited migrants to sleep in their own homes. Maria del Carmen Ortega Garcia, a barrel-chested woman with a big smile, lets migrants sleep in her room in her, Vera, in her house in Veracruz. Ortega started small, offering migrants a cup of coffee, then a place to bathe. They remind her of her 18-year-old son. In 1995, he was deported from California. She does not know what happened after he was driven across the border. She never heard from him again. Others simply hide migrants from the police. Another townsperson in Veracruz, Baltasar Brenis Avile, Avila, empathizes with migrants. His two sons walked for days to enter the United States through searing heat and with little drinking water. They dodged snakes as well as bandits trying to assault them. Now they work as car washers in Orange County, California. When I help someone here, I feel like I'm giving food to my children, Brenis says. I bet people help them too. Brenis, who lives two blocks from the train tracks, had fed a 25-year-old Honduran migrant some tacos. The man was on his porch, getting ready to leave, when a blue and white state police car cruised down the dirt road. Brenis whisked the migrant inside. The police knocked. Turn him over. He's a migrant. We're going to arrest him. If you don't turn him over, we'll arrest you too for being a smuggler. The police had pistols and machine guns. Brenis knew that people charged with smuggling can spend years in jail. Brenis, who sells rustic chairs door to door, tried to mask the terror he felt inside. He politely said that there was no reason to turn the man over. He told the visitor, he told them the visitor was a relative from an outlying farm. The police retreated. Brenis said the mi- let the migrant stay for an hour until he was sure the coast was clear. New Cargo As the train nears the town of Cordoba, the migrants finish their water, knowing it is tricky to jump off the train and run fast with a bottle in their hands. Enrique grabs the bag of rolls he got from the food throwers. He is hungry, but he saves the rolls for later. He fears there will be all he- they will be all he has to eat for a while. As the train slows, he leaps and runs. He avoids the station's security guards and eases to a walk. He sits on a sidewalk one block north of the station. Two police officers approach. His odds are better if he does not bolt. Fleeing would look suspicious. He tucks his bag of rolls into a crevice. He swallows his fright and tries to look unconcerned. The officers, in navy blue uniforms, walk straight up to him. He does not move or even flinch. Cops can sense fear. They can tell if someone is illegal. You have to be calm, he he says to himself. You can't seem afraid. Look them in the eye. 
be brave. Unlike the townspeople, the police do not bear gifts. They pull out pistols. If you run, I'll shoot you, one says, aiming at Enrique's chest. They take him and two younger boys sitting nearby to a big shed in the railroad, a big shed by the railroad, where officers are holding 20 migrants. It is a full-scale sweep. They line up the migrants against a wall. Take everything out of your pockets. Bribing the police is the only way for Enrique to keep himself from being deported back to Central America. He has 30 pesos, about $3, that he earned lifting rocks and sweeping near the tracks a few towns back. Some officers will let you go for 20 pesos, others demand 50 or more, and then turn you over to La Migra to be deported anyway. Now he prays the coins he has will be enough. One officer pats him down and says to empty his pockets. Enrique drops his belt, a raider's cap, and the 30 pesos. He glances at his fellow migrants. Each is standing behind a little pile of belongings. Get out! Leave! He will not be deported after all. But he pauses. He gathers up his courage. Can I get my things back? My money? What money? The officer hisses. Forget about it. Unless you want to have your trip stop here. Enrique turns his back and walks away. Even in Veracruz, where strangers can be so kind, the authorities cannot be trusted. Exhausted, Enrique retrieves his bag of rolls, climbs onto a flatbed truck, and sleeps. At dawn, he hears a train. He trots alongside a freight car and clambers aboard once more, still holding his rolls. The Mountains As Enrique pushes north toward the United States, Mexico changes. The tracks, smoother now, begin to climb. The air grows cooler. The train passes 60-foot-tall stalks of bamboo. It crosses a long bridge over a deep canyon. It rolls through putrid white smoke that billows from a Kimberly Clark factory that turns sugarcane pulp into tissues and toilet paper. Back in Wasaka, he rolled through cattle country. It was so hot, the tracks behind him looked like a squiggly line warped by heat. In the humidity, green moss balls grew on the electrical wires by the tracks. He was drenched in sweat. In Veracruz, he rode through rows of silvery pineapple plants and lush fields of tall, thin sugarcane stalks that brushed up against the train. He saw homes where people put day-old tortillas on their roofs to dry, on their tin roofs to dry. All around him were swamps and mosquitoes. He had to watch out for bees. He had heard that when smoke from the locomotive angers bees, they swarm and attack migrants on top of the cars. The closer they get to the north, the more valuable the cargo carried on the train is. Volkswagens, Fords, and Chryslers. The trains are longer, better maintained, and they glide more smoothly. There are fewer riders on board now. Many migrants do not make it this far. On some trains, Enrique sees only a dozen others. In Orizaba, the train pauses to change crews. Enrique asks a man standing near the tracks, Can you give me one peso to buy some food? The man inquires about his scars. There from the beating he got on top of the train a little more than a week ago now. The man gives Enrique fifteen pesos, about one fifty. Enrique runs to buy soda and cheese to go with his rolls. He looks north. Beyond a range of verdant mountains, he sees the snow-covered Pico de Orizaba, the highest summit in Mexico. Now the weather will turn icy cold, especially at night, much different from the steamy lowlands. Enrique begs two sweaters. Before the train pulls out, he runs from car to car, looking into the hollows at the ends of the hoppers, where riders occasionally discard clothing. In one, he finds a blanket. As the train starts, Enrique shares the cheese, soda, and rolls he has saved with two boys he has met. The two boys are also headed for the United States. One is 13, the other is 17. Enrique relishes his new friends. He loves how riders take care of one another, pass along what they know, and divide what they have. Migrants will often designate one person to look out for trouble while the others rest. They give one another advice. In places where migrants spring out from the shadows, sprinting to get on the moving train, migrants atop the cars shout out if the train is going dangerously fast. Don't do it! You'll get nailed! They yell. When Enrique lands an extra shirt or a tip about where to avoid the police, he shares. Other migrants have been generous with him. They have told him Mexican slang words they have learned. One offered a bit of soap when Enrique slipped into a shallow green river to bathe. Enrique realizes that the friendships will be fleeting. Very few who set out together, including brothers, stay together until the end. Often migrants abandon an injured member of their group rather than risk being caught by the authorities. As Enrique waits in Veracruz for the train to leave, 
a 31-year-old Salvadoran tells how he recently watched a man get his right leg cut off as he was trying to elude La Migra at a train stop. The Salvadoran stripped off his shirt and cinched it tightly around the man's leg to try and stop the bleeding. Then he ran away, fearful La Migra would arrest him. Don't leave me, the injured man cried out. The man died later that day. Often between train rides, Enrique prefers to sleep alone in a tall clump of grass away from other migrants, knowing it will make him less of a target. Still, camaraderie means, often means survival. I could get to the north faster alone, Enrique figures, but I might not make it. The mountains close in. Enrique invites his two friends to share the blanket he found earlier. Together they will be warmer. The three jam themselves between a grate and an opening on top of a hopper. Enrique stuffs rags under his head for a pillow. The car sways, and its wheels click-clack quietly. They sleep. Now the train passes through the first of 32 tunnels. Sometimes the tail of the train hasn't left one tunnel before the locomotive dives into another. Outside is bright sun. Inside is darkness so black that riders cannot see their own hands. They shout, ay, 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 and listen to the deep, haunting echo. Enrique and his friends sleep on. Back in the daylight, a train rounds a hillside. The freight cars creak as they turn the curves. Below, a valley is filled with fields of corn, radishes, and lettuce, each a different hue of green. El Mexicano is the largest tunnel. For eight minutes, the train vanishes inside. Black diesel smoke rises. It burns the lungs and stings the eyes. Some of the migrants bolt down the ladders in the dark, trying to escape the toxic haze. Enrique's eyes are closed, but his face and arms turn gray. His nose runs black soot. If a locomotive overheats inside the tunnel, the train must stop. Riders spring for the exits, gasping for clean air. Ice forms on the train cars. Migrants huddle between the cars, seeking protection from the biting wind. Some are wearing just T-shirts. Their lips crack. Their eyes grow dull. They pull their shirts over their mouths to warm themselves with their breath. When the train slows, they jog alongside to ward off the cold. Some risk moving forward to the last of the train's three locomotives to press against the engine. Some stand on the warm wisps of diesel smoke. As night falls, some of the older migrants drink whiskey. Too much and they tumble off. Others gather old clothing and trash and build fires on the ledges over the wheels of the hoppers. They hold their hands close to the fire, then press their palms to their frigid faces. At the first light, the tracks straighten and level out. At one and a half miles above sea level, the train accelerates to 35 miles per hour. Enrique awakens. He sees cultivated cactus on both sides. Directly in front rise two huge pyramids, the pre-Aztec metropolis of Teotihuacan. Then he sees housing developments, a billboard for Paradise Spa, a sewage ditch, taxis. The train slows for the station at Lecheria. Enrique gets ready to run. He is in Mexico City. Suspicion. Enrique starts knocking on doors, begging for food, but the Veracruz hospitality has vanished. In Mexico City, people are edgy and often hostile, especially toward migrants. I'm afraid of them, one woman near the track says, wrinkling her nose. They talk funny. They're dirty. Another woman, who is soft-spoken and wears silver-rimmed spectacles and a gold cross on a chain, around her neck, turns cold when she is asked about migrants. She tells a story about a young man who was attacked, robbed, and raped by a group of male migrants and left naked and nearly dead. Before, she had felt pity for migrants, she says. After that, people closed their doors. She wonders how many among the innocent migrants traveling north are dangerous men, running from the law in their own countries. Now, when migrants ask her several times a day for help, a taco, a coffee, a shirt, or a pair of socks, she always turns them down flat. The city is dangerous enough as it is, she adds. In Mexico City, crime is rampant. Churches hire armed guards to ensure peaceful services. Enrique notices that Mexicans are quick to defend their right to migrate to the United States. Jesus was a migrant, he hears them say. But most won't give Central Americans who have arrived in their country food, money, or jobs. Enrique goes house to house, hoping for mercy. Finally, at one house, he receives another gift. A woman offers him tortillas, beans, and lemonade. Now he must hide from the state police, who guard the de depot at Lecheria, a gritty industrial neighborhood on the northwestern outskirts of Mexico City. 
Gray smog hovers over the smokestacks. There is a scrap metal recycling plant, a sprawling Goodyear tire factory, and a plastics factory. Lecheria is 13 miles from the heart of Mexico's rail system. Still, the station here bustles with activity. The railroad tracks are littered with broken dolls, old tires, dead dogs, and worn shoes. Enrique must avoid La Migra. The authorities sometimes show up at the station in unmarked cars. Most migrants at the station hide between or inside boxcars or in the grass. Enrique crawls into a three-foot-wide concrete gutter pipe, one of several strewn in a field north of the station. The field is filled with cows and sheep and bursting with yellow and purple flowers. Outside the gutter pipe where Enrique hides, trains clang and clash, crash as workers add and subtract cars, forming trains that are nearly a mile long. Enrique must pick trains wisely. He knows some train companies use fewer security guards than others. He looks out for those. Enrique chooses a 10.30 p.m. northbound train. It travels all the way to the Texas border, mostly at night, when the dark will make it harder to spot him. Enrique and his two new friends from the train pick a boxcar. The boys load cardboard to lie on in order to stay clean. Enrique spots a blanket on a nearby hopper. He climbs a ladder to get it and hears a loud buzz from overhead. Live wires carry electricity above the trains for 143 miles north. Signs warn danger, high voltage, but many of the migrants cannot read, and they don't even need to touch the wires to be killed. The electricity arcs outward up to 20 inches. Enrique climbs the hopper car. Carefully, he snatches a corner of the blanket and yanks it down. Then he scrambles back to his box car and settles into a bed that he and his friends have fashioned out of straw they found inside. Soon, he tells himself, he might make it to the border. It is within his grasp. The landscape turns more and more desolate, sand and brush, jackrabbits and snakes. They cross boulders, dry riverbeds, and canyons with sheer rock walls. They plow through a heavy fog, and Enrique sleeps. The boys jump off the train early, half a mile south of San Luis San Luis Potosí, where 64 railroad security officers guard the station. Enrique goes in search of food. One person gives him an orange. Another gives him three tacos. He shares them with his friends. Until now, Enrique has opted to keep moving, finding food and money as quickly as possible before moving on. Once, in Chiapas, he survived on mangoes for three days. But here the countryside is too desolate and dry for a migrant to live off the land. Begging is always risky. There are no fruit trees or fields in sight, just factories that make glass and furniture. He needs to work if he's going to survive. Besides, he does not want to reach America penniless. He has heard that U.S. ranchers shoot migrants who come to beg. He trudges up a hill to the small home of a brickmaker. Politely, Enrique asks the man for food. The brickmaker offers yet another kindness. If Enrique will work at the brickyard, he will get both food and a place to sleep. Happily, Enrique accepts. Some Central American migrants say Mexican employers exploit them. The employers refuse to pay for work the migrants have done, or pay only a fraction of the minimum wage. But the brickmaker does better than that. He pays Enrique well and gives the boy shoes and clothing. For a day and a half, Enrique works at the brickyard, shoveling clay. At the end of the day, covered in clay and manure dust, he bathes in a cattle trough. At night, he sleeps in a shed on a dirt floor he shares with one of his friends from the train. It is the first time on his journey that he has stopped running. He has grown used to living for the moment. Now, for the first time, he pauses to reflect. He thinks about hugging his mother when they are together again. I have to get to the border, Enrique tells his friend. He wonders, should he risk taking another train? In all of his attempts, he has survived more than 30 train rides. This time, freight cars have brought him 990 miles from Tapachula near Guatemala. Is he pushing his luck to keep traveling this way? The brickmaker offers Enrique advice. Take a shuttle van through the checkpoint north of town, he tells him, then a bus to another town called Matahuala. Finally, hitchhike on a truck from there to Nueva Laredo. There, only a river, the Rio Grande, will separate you from Texas. Enrique thanks the brickmaker for his advice and collects his pay, 120 pesos. He buys a toothbrush and an 83 peso bus ticket. Three hours later, a pink archway welcomes him to Matahuala. There, he walks to a truck stop. Matahuala is on a principal route for truckers headed to the United States. Fleets of 18-wheelers roll by. 
I don't have any money, he tells every driver he sees. Can you give me a ride however far north you are going? One after another, they turn him down. Many have made the lonely haul from Mexico City who would many having made the lonely haul from Mexico City would love to have the company for the remaining three hundred and eighty miles to the border. Still, if they said yes, police might accuse them of smuggling to justify asking for bribes. Moreover, some of the truckers fear that migrants might assault them. Finally, at 10 a.m., one driver takes the risk. Enrique pulls himself up into the cab of a truck hauling beer. Where are you from? The driver asks. Honduras. Where are you going? The driver has seen boys like Enrique before. Do you have a mom or dad in the United States? Enrique tells him about his mother. A sign at Los Positos says, checkpoint in 100 meters. The truck idles in line. Then it inches forward. The driver is ready. You are my assistant, he declares to Enrique. I am your assistant, Enrique repeats back. Federal police called judiciales ask the driver what he is carrying. They want his papers. They peer at Enrique, but the officers do not ask any questions. A few feet farther on, soldiers stop each vehicle to search for drugs and guns. Two young recruits wave them through. Enrique exhales a sigh of relief. The scenery changes again. Joshua trees give way to low-lying scrub brush. The driver clears two more checkpoints. As he nears the Rio Grande, he stops to eat. He buys Enrique a plate of eggs and refried beans and a soda, another gift. Sixteen miles before the border, he sees a sign. Reduce your speed. Nuevo Laredo Customs. Don't worry, the driver says. La Migra check only the buses. The next sign says, Bienvenidos a Nuevo Laredo. Welcome to Nuevo Laredo. The driver stops him off outside the city, near its airport, just past the Motel California. With the 30 pesos he has left, Enrique takes a bus that winds into the Plaza Hidalgo, a city park the size of a square block, in the heart of Nuevo Laredo. Nuevo Laredo. Nuevo Laredo is a border town alongside the Rio Bravo, as the river is known here. Called the Rio Grande in the United States, the river divides Mexico from Texas. Enrique marvels at how far he has come, how close he has come to getting caught and deported over and over again. Time after time, his luck is held. His heart swells with enormous hope. This hope is fragile. It could be punctured like a balloon in an instant. The thought of doing a ninth trip after he has come this far is nauseating. He must remain cautious. Enrique has no money. He pivots his head to look around the Plaza, the plaza Hidalgo. It is full of people. Some are migrants who sit on the steps of the big clock tower. Others are smugglers who circulate, offering, in a whisper, to take people over to the United States for a good price. Where does he go from here? Whom can he trust to ask for advice? Through sheer chance, he spots a Honduran man whom he met on the train. Enrique races over to him. The man offers to help. He takes Enrique to an encampment along the Rio Grande. Enrique likes it. He decides to stay until he can cross. That night, as the sun sets, Enrique stares across the Rio Grande and gazes at the United States. It looms as a mystery. Somewhere over there lies his, lives his mother. She has become a mystery, too. He was so young when she left that he can barely remember what she looks like. Curly hair, eyes like chocolate. Her voice is a distant sound on the phone. Enrique has spent 47 days bent on nothing but surviving. Now, as he thinks about her, he is overwhelmed.